spend several weeks on, uh, in talking about uh, love and applying the area of love to our church, to our families, and our marriage, in our, in our, our life. And so we're going to have a wonderful time talking about love. And, uh, and Paul begins by addressing the area of love in terms of an, uh, without love, what we do is really an exercise of futility. Now, some of you uh, have been kind of looking at me funny uh, in the last five days or so. And kind of looking, wait, is, is he wearing makeup over one eye? You know, what, what's he doing? Well, you don't, you don't have to look really hard and wondering if I'm, I'm trying to be an ice skating commentator. I'm, 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 uh, I, 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 I gave myself a black eye. And uh, we, were, we were playing ping pong, and I, I, I did a big top spin. I missed the ball. I hit my glasses off and, and, and killer spinned uh, right into my, my eye. And so I got this nice big black eye. And, uh, and, and sometimes ministry that is without love is that kind of an exercise of futility. It's a big swing and a miss, and we only end up hurting ourselves. And this is the concern that the Apostle Paul has with the Church of Corinth. That in their ministry, because they are self-centered, they are having problems with unity. They're having problems of uh, of truth. They're having problems with doctrine. They're having problems with, with grace and accepting others. They're having problems with with love and he is asking the church of corinth to imitate god to bear the attributes of god in their disunity he he points out god is one and we are to be unified as god is unified god is love and he wants us to to not boast of the ministry abilities we have or in this particular context spiritual gifts but he wants us really to exercise this area of love. So this Valentine's weekend, I was excited that during the Valentine's weekend, it fell right on our order of preaching, right into as we go through 1 Corinthians, right here on the topic of love. But what does love mean? Because love can mean so many different things. Some people will uh, uh, use the phrase, I think I mean love, you know, with like Taco Bell, you know, or... or, or you know, at school, and do you think you're in love, but you're really in puppy love or, or an infatuation. Or we, or we use the term, I love ribeye more than flank steak, you know, and you're, you're making a preference. Or we talk about make love or uh, other usage of love. It can mean so many different things. But here, Paul is going to give us a wonderful definition of love. And uh, we have here the first three verses, but I really like to read through verse 8. Because here we get Paul's great definition of love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endears all things. Love never fails. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that as we spend several weeks talking about what love is and how you've defined it here in this important passage in the context of church ministry, Father, I pray that you will help us to not only understand what love is, but to But as we do, that we will love you in the right way. And that we will love our church family in the right way. And that we will love the people in our lives, our husbands, wives, and parents, and children, and and family members, and friends, in a way that is reflective of you 
being the God that is love itself. And so, Father, we thank you for this time that we can talk about this wonderful subject. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As English has several different meanings of love, from puppy love to, uh, uh, to, to the idea of emotional passion or preference, in the Greek language of the New Testament times, there were four words that were used for the area of love. And uh, agape, phileo, stergo, and eros. Uh, agape was the most common biblical word for love and, and is very extreme in terms of going beyond emotion or passion. It was very dutiful in the way that it was used. And, and the great concept is that of sacrifice. Uh, we see this in terms of God's love for man, man's love for God, people loving others. You know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart is this agape love. To love others as yourself is this agape love. And this is, this is a, a love that is sacrificial, or as Ken Sandy said, has, this word has little to do with feelings. It is sacrificial, giving, an active type of love. And so this is the word that Paul uses here in 1 Corinthians 13, this, this great love of sacrifice. But there's, other, uh, there's another great biblical word for love. And it's the, the word phileo. You know, if you are an audiophile, right? How many of you are audiophiles? All right, yeah. Okay, I, I know there should be more hands going up because uh, you know, I, I know you are lovers of sound, right? Audio is all, all things that have to do with sound and file. It comes from phileo, which means love. So it's a lover of sound, and you like, uh, you know, you, you, you know the difference between bows and beats by dr dre and you know i mean you can figure all those things out because you're an audiophile and uh, but but it's this this love that comes from this this uh, greek word phileo and uh you know if if you really like seafood you might be phileo fish <laughs> no, just, but, but this was used of god uh, god's the father's love for the son uh, god's love for the disciples jesus rebuking in the spirit of love because he, he loves his friend. This has even be, been combined with the Greek word adelphos, which means brother, for Philadelphus, which, or Philadelphia, which is the city of brotherly love. But, uh, but this is the word phileo that comes. Then there's two other words that aren't really in the scriptures. Um, there's the word stergo that has to do with family love. It's, it's a husband's love for his wife. It's a parent's love for a child or their child lower their parents. Um, it, it's not found in the New Testament, though its antonym has been found in the New Testament. It, it's opposite uh, of being heartless, and it's been used a couple of times in Scripture. It's, it's, uh, it's, negative, um, uh, uh, it's negative evil twin. And then there's, uh, there's the word eros, where we get our term erotic from, which talks about the passionate desire, physical aspects of, of love. But in terms of what's, what's a wonderful way to define love? I mean, we talk about this sacrificial friendship love, family love, sensual love, but, but what's, a, what's a good working definition? How can I really define and understand love, particularly in the agape sense? And, uh, and I really love Chuck Swindoll's definition, and I've used it in several weddings, and, uh, but it's love is taking the initiative and acting sacrificially to meet the needs of others. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of love when, when Jesus, when we were still sinners, gave of himself for us. Right? I mean, we had nothing to offer him, but he took the initiative to pay for our salvation. We weren't seeking it. We weren't looking for it, but he reached out and he gave it to us. And so this is the, the initiative. And then acting sacrificially is when he went to the cross and, and then he, uh, to, to meet our need of a savior. And, uh, and so this is uh, s depicted beautifully in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so here we see his initiative while we were still sinners. Here we see his great sacrifice that he, Christ, died. 
And then you see how it meets our needs for us in our place because we couldn't pay for our salvation. And so that's a great definition of Christ's love that can be imported to a love a husband has for his wife or that we have for the church, or that we have for one another, that we'll take initiative. And as uh, that City Impact video demonstrated, right? I mean, we go to people and ask, what needs do you have? We're having that, that, uh, that what's it called, free, free market, right? Instead of a flea market, we have a free market where we give stuff away to the community, and we don't ask for anything. And, and we, basically, we ask, can we give you literature or a bible you know that's what we want to ask and and, uh, and and so we we give take initiative and give and that's that will be uh, emblematic of what christ did but as we are we're also still kind of trying to figure out what love is uh, there was another uh, wonderful way of understanding love from uh, a fellow by the name of josh mcdowell and he, he said there's three kind of loves. He says there's the I love you if. Right? The, the I love you if. I love you if you exceed my expectations. I love you if you do what I want you to do. You know, I, I, I love you if you'll kiss me. Right? You know, it's those kind of expectations that people might have. And, and a condition is placed on love. I love you if. Then there's the second kind of love which is the I love you because. You know, there's a reason, perhaps, of your beauty. I love you because you're beautiful. I love you because of your personality. I love you because you got money. You know, we may not admit that, but, you know, maybe some people are thinking that way. Or I love you because you make me secure, but there's a reason attached to it. So there's a conditional love. There's uh, a love with reason. But then there's the... The, the officially to meet the, the needs of others. And, and it's not responding out of a reason. It's love that does not respond out of expectations, but I love you, period. And it is this great agape love, a love of sacrifice, a, a love of I love you, period, that needs to be our love for one another in the church. Not because I love you because I know you. I love you because you're my friend. I'll do whatever you need because I'm close to you or because you're family, but will go beyond and reach out in love. And so, so what's interesting, as, as Paul talks about love in the city of Corinth to a sophisticated audience who says, well, I know what love is. You know, you're going to try to tell me what love is? I mean, we're, we're Corinth. I mean, we have the God of love in our city. Aphrodite, we got a temple for her, and those are the ruins of the Aphrodite's temple in Corinth. And, and, and they say, well, we know all about love. They don't. I mean, uh, Aphrodite is supposed to be this goddess of love, and, you know, Julius Caesar was said to have been descended from this, uh, from this goddess, and and then even his adopted son, Augustus, who succeeded him, was also said to have connections in his family tree back to this quote-unquote goddess. Uh, but, um, you know, but, but this goddess also had temple prostitutes where people would try to uh, engage in immorality to in excite this goddess of love to bring more love connections to them. You know? And so, uh, so, so they didn't really have a clue. Their culture would be no help to them. And our culture today will be no help for us in understanding what love is. Because love for us is a Hollywood romance movie, right? Where, where it is emotionally bound. It is the fulfilling of expectations or the exceeding of expectations. But it is not, it is not the love of the Scripture or the love of Christ which is defined in our society as what love is. And so as the Corinthian gives us no help, neither does our entertainment culture, neither does our, our um, you know, our, perhaps you come out of a culture, well, if you love me, then you'll make me proud, right? If you love me, then, you know, you will, uh, uh, you, you will bear your family name with honor, not shame, you know, and so, so love is connected with honor and 
you know, hate is connected with shame. And, and so there's these false dichotomies that are just brought up by perhaps different cultures. And so that's why it is important to understand the necessity of, of God's definition of what love is. And so in these first three verses, Paul uses just very, uh, very profound language. Again, as we've been talking about all in our 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the context is spiritual gifts. And Paul defines spiritual gifts. He talks about what spiritual gifts are. And, uh, but yet, the people in the church of Corinth were exercising their spiritual gifts with a great amount of uh, pompousness, pride, arrogance. Uh, they were exercising gifts so people would look at them and say, wow, look what Steve did. Look what Kevin did. A a instead of saying, wow, look what God did through a couple of schleps. You know, look what... God can do through the insignificant. Look what, why God chose the weak to topple the strong and those that don't know much to topple those who think that they are wise. Why, 1 Corinthians told us earlier, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why not many noble are called. That's why not many erudite or, or aristocratic are called. God wants to use average people. And he gives spiritual gifts so that average, normal people can do something supernatural in the church of God and the community he wants us to reach. Right? And so, so this is Paul's, uh, Paul's thrust of having a loving ministry. Otherwise, without love, everything we say is pointless. Everything we are is useless. And everything we do is unprofitable. And so let's talk about his, his first point here, where he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong. No offense if your last name is Gong. But, but I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And so he's basically saying, if, if our ministry is without love, and we're just going to sound like this. And that's all we're going to sound like. None of this. I always want to do that. Thanks. But I uh, uh, hope I didn't mess up your, your, uh, your setup there, Al. But it, it's this, you ever been in the, um, you ever been to some of those Buddhist funerals? And, you know, they got the incense going, and then they're, they're going, and, and, you know, for an hour, there'll be this clang of that gong just for an hour, clang, 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 and, and there's, it's monotonous, it, it doesn't have range, it doesn't have expression, it's just, it's just monotonous, there's no dynamic uh, to it, and it, it just seems futile, and, and that's what he is saying here, that, that, uh, that though we might speak with this tongue, and now it's amazing because what he is using here. He is describing the gift of tongues, but he's describing it with such a superfluous, inflated concept to say that, you know, let's say I had the gift of tongues, and it was greater than any man's. You know, I mean, you know, maybe somebody's gift of tongues is able to speak Swahili and interpret it by one who can interpret it, or someone can speak Chinese, or someone can speak French, or someone can speak you know, Akkadian or <clears throat> Egyptian or, or whatever, you know, oh, I don't know Egyptian's language, but it, it, he, he's saying, let's say I have the gift that can speak them all, right? So he says, though I speak with the tongue, uh, tongues of men, you know, all of them, and to excel even what angels could do if they were to have this particular gift. And, and so, so he's using this as, let's say, let's say I just had the best gift of tongues that can ever be conceived. Right? So this, this is how he's speaking here. If I speak with the tongues and of men and of angels, if it was the greatest gift of tongues ever, and remember, he prioritized the gifts just in the passage earlier at the end of 1 Corinthians 12. Tongues isn't even as great as prophecy or of the apostles, you know? And, and, uh, and those aren't, aren't as important. Tongues was kind of a fourth-class rated gift. But he said, let's say I just had the first class rated gift of tongues. If I didn't have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging 
symbol. Now, these clanging symbols were very well known to the pagan culture um, of uh, Sibylle. Sibylle was uh, the goddess of war and victory. Uh, she was imported from Asia Minor, and when Rome picked her up as a goddess, um, uh, and they would call her the Great Mother, the Magna Mater, um, uh, they say it was because of her that Rome was able to stop Hannibal's invasion. And, and uh, kind of, I was reading this story on, on her, it's kind of weird, but, but uh, this, this Sibylle had a son who was her lover, and you know, he, uh, again, this is Roman mythology, okay? Uh, but but he, she forbade him to love anybody else other than him. And there's more I don't want to get into. But the idea is that uh, when Sibylle's uh, worshipers followed her, they would just clang these symbols, and it would just be monotonous and pointless. And, you know, and there is no Sibylle, right? There, there is no... There is no goddess, uh, Roman goddess of victory or war. So it's this noise made to nothing. You know, it is not a joyful noise unto the Lord. It is just a clanging symbol. And, and, the, and here is a statue of Sibylle over here, and she's carrying one of those gongs or the symbols. And um, in fact, Corinth, special metal, a little blend of bronze uh, that, uh, uh, that, that they had uh, particularly for that purpose. And without the area of love, basically everything that we say is pointless. Everything we say is pointless. You know, now sometimes we think, wow, you know, as you heard me say last week, I don't believe the gift of tongues is operative today, but maybe today we think, wow, I've got a lot of stuff to say to people. You know, I, I've got a lot of stuff that I need to tell the church, that they need to benefit from my knowledge and, um, and maybe so, maybe so. Yesterday, we had a, a wonderful occasion uh, where uh, our college and career folks put on a luncheon for our seniors. And, uh, and uh, we had several of our seniors come out. They outnumbered our college career folks. It was great. And we, we opened it up for a time of them sharing wisdom to us. You know, and they had a lot of great things to say. We asked them things like, um, you know, what, what do you know about God now that you wish you knew in your 20s? Right? Or, or what, was life, what, what did you experience in life when you were growing up that we haven't experienced in our life growing up? And we had lots of stories on what life was like in the Second World War, you know, and those that, that, that were in it. And those that were children during the war time, and I mean, there was there was a lot to say, and uh, you know, and we prefaced it by reading Titus two two and saying, you know, older men, you need to teach younger men to be sober, and you know, and older women, you need to teach younger women so that they can they can be loving and respectful, and you know, and, and just right out of Titus two, and wow, it, it was it was just. I, I wish we had a longer time because there's just so much wisdom there. Uh, but, um, but, but maybe you have a lot to say. Maybe you have a lot of good things to say. Maybe you're a biblical scholar and you have much to impart theologically and exegetically and expositionally to a, a, a hungry congregation. That's great. But if it's without love, it's nothing. If, if, and, and that's why um, I, I like, somebody said this, and I, I don't remember who said it, but, but I've always carried this with me. They say if, how does it go? Oh, people care, people care more about, uh, uh, okay, now I, I, I'm drawing by. It, it, it comes out more like, it, it's uh, before people care about what you know, people want to know if you love them. I mean, that's, that's the gist of what I'm trying to say. I forgot the good quote. Somebody remind me later, right? But, but it, it, a lot of times we think we have a lot of stuff to say, but unless we really love the folks, it, it can be empty. There was a, a Scottish preacher by the name of Andrew Bonar, and, uh, and he heard a young Scottish preacher preach. And, and he, after he heard him preach, he says, oh, 
So you love to preach, don't you? Okay, he was Scottish. And the young man said, yes, I love to preach. And then Andrew Bronar asked him, but do you love the people to whom you're preaching? Do you love the people to whom you're preaching? And here, the Apostle Paul is saying, we might have a lot to say, but without love, it's pointless. It's just this sounding gong, this symbol of Sibylle. And, uh, and, and he uses this reference to just make that point of, of a monotonous, meaningless, loveless lecture. Then he says, without love, everything I am is useless. And then he goes in to describe the, these, these special gifts, which we defined as these revelatory gifts that God gave to serve as the foundation of the early church before the New Testament was complete. And he, he says, uh, though I have prophetic powers, and then this gift of wisdom which enables him to understand all mysteries. And then we talked about this a special gift of knowledge. And I had all knowledge, not just knowledge, but all knowledge. And, uh, and then remember, remember there was a gift of faith as well. But he says, if I have all faith. So he's using these terms of inflationary gifts as a way of causing a great um, contrast. To say without love, it's nothing. You know, we think these gifts are great and wonderful, and even if I had them to its extreme and I had all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. So remember, the gift of prophecy has to do with revelation, where they are receiving revelation from God. This is before the New Testament was complete. Now I believe revelation is complete. We're not adding to the Word of God at, at all. Um, then there was this gift of wisdom, which we defined as the spiritual ability to understand all the mysteries of God and to perceive truth and situations from God's perspective. Again, I think it was one of the special gifts. And then the gift of knowledge, which Robert Thomas in his book, Understanding Spiritual Gifts, defines as a special ability to grasp objective data that results from special revelation connected with the word of wisdom to systematize it and extend its implications to new situations. In other words, they can take the revelation from God, they can clarify it and apply it. Right? That, that was just kind of a big way to say these people were able to take the revelation that was coming in and then they can clarify it and apply it. Those are the people with the gift of, no, the gift of knowledge. And, uh, and then the gift of faith was the spiritual enablement to trust God to overcome certain situations. You know, now... Does God want us to have faith now? Yes. But back then, this particular gift of faith was, was specific for, for um, along with the revelation, trusting that it was going to come true. Right? And so there was this particular gift of faith. So he's saying, though I have all of this, and though I have all knowledge, Robert Gormacki said, a full head with an empty heart is worth nothing. A full head with an empty heart. Here's the, the phrase. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I knew it would come to me. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right? And, and that's why love is so important here. Then he, uh, and then he makes these references that, that allude, uh, for example, in faith, that allude to Mark eleven twenty three. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. And so this reference to moving mountains perhaps is connected to this passage that Jesus said about the area of faith that's able to move mountains. And if Paul is saying, if I have this faith that's able to move mountains and I don't have love, it's nothing. Right? And, and so you might have a very solid Christian walk because you're reading your Bible all the time, you know, and you're talking to God all the time, but then you don't love God's people. What's that? It's nothing. You know, so what good is it to have all this faith, to have all these spiritual gifts, to have all these abilities, to have all this knowledge, and, and we don't love people? 
And so that's what we need to ask ourselves. Do we really love the Lord? Because if we did, we would really love people. Third, without love, and I feel like singing that hairspray song, without love, because you know, my kids sing it all the time. But without love, everything I do is unprofitable. He says, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I profit nothing. My efforts are unprofitable. If I go through the roads of ministry, it becomes a routine and I'm going through the motions and nursery and junior church and youth group and Bible study, and it just becomes routine, all right? I just check it off the list. Then everything we do is unprofitable. Even if we sacrifice to the degree where we would give our body to be burned, and if you put on your degree, maybe that's not going to be your problem today. But, uh, you know, perhaps Paul is referring to the fiery furnace. Perhaps he's anticipating in the 60s the persecution by Emperor Nero where he's going to take Christians and light them up as living human torches. What a sick, sick guy he was. You know, but, uh, but, but maybe there's the, the understanding, uh, even if Paul went through all of that, even to the extreme of martyrdom, if he was martyred, without a love for God and his people, it would amount to nothing. It would amount to nothing. And so we can, so, you know, when we start thinking of the church, well, I do so much for the church, you know, or I know so much Bible, or, oh, I'm going to work for this church till I die, you know, and we say that just kind of in our, our martyrdom speak. God needs to remind us, are we doing this because we're checking on us off a list? Are we doing this because we're some kind of ascetic monk, you know, where we're trying to deny ourselves pleasure and fun, and, you know, we, we, we think, of, oh, I just have to, you know, be in self-flagellation and punishment and, and all these different types of things so that, you know, I can prove to God that I love him? No. He says, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, you love others. That's what he wants to see. You know, and, you know, perhaps he's making this reference of, of, uh, of giving away all that he had, you know, where, where Jesus says, you know, hey, go give everything you have to the poor and then come follow me. And Paul is saying, look, if I did all of that, which he did, you know, and I, I would give everything up to follow you, which Paul did. But Paul said, if I didn't have love, that extreme of martyrdom or self-sacrifice is really worth nothing. And so, so how do we apply this? How do we apply this? We need to guard ourselves from what I like to call the Tin Man Syndrome. All right. What was Tin Man looking for on the yellow brick road? Yeah, he wanted to have a heart. And uh, if I only had a heart... And, uh, and, and this needs to be central to our ministry. Have we lost our heart for ministry? And ministry now only becomes performance-based. Because we grew up in a performance-based home, right? Well, you know, you do this, you do this, you do that. You get approval if you do this, you get approval if you do that. And so we come to church thinking, oh, I need to do this, do this, do that, do that, do that. And we get so into the to-do list, we forget about the to-love list. You know, even in our prayers, do we just pray because we're dutiful? Or do we pray because we love the people we're praying for? Right? Are we preparing lessons because, you know, that's my job and that's my gift. I got the gift of teaching and I'm really good at teaching and I know how to outline, I know how to alliterate, I know how to do a word study and I know how to do all of this. And, you know, and they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. So I guess it's up to me. Those lucky people. Or do we do this because we love the people whom we're preparing our Bible study for, who we're preparing our flannel graph lesson for, and we're passionate because we don't want to see them go unrepentant? You know, I take a lot of pictures. I think sometimes it's a curse. Because I look back at these pictures and I see 
How many people don't come anymore? And I, I don't mean going to other churches, which is fine. I mean, don't love the Lord anymore. Or don't care anymore. And sometimes I go back 10 years, I go back five years, and I say, what happened? You know, are, 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 we, are we doing this because we don't want them to fall away? We, we don't want them to go to hell. You know, that, that's got to be our, our motivation when we're preparing that flannel graph lesson, when we're preparing a worship set. You know, when we're, uh, when, when we're filling up communion or setting up chairs, uh, you know, we, we need to be praying, Lord, I pray that the people that will come and sit in this chair that I'm setting up, that their heart is going to receive your message because they need it. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God, and if we don't love, we don't know God, because God is all about love, because God is love, and, and so this challenge to this one another will define whether really we love or not. Do we love? Well, then are we doing the one another's? Without love, ministry is superficial. And this is the point of 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 1 to 3. Love is superficial. I was, um, one, of the, one of the neat things I get to do is, it's a couple of times a year I get to go to Atlanta and we, we interview missionary candidates. I mean, these, these are people who, you know, raise their hand at missions conferences or, or get a call from the Lord as they're praying and say, boy, I, I want to be a missionary. And, and so we, we get these people who, who are just top-notch, prime, love the Lord uh, and, and ready to serve. And, and we, get to, uh, uh, we get to interview them and, and approve them. And, and I remember during one particular interview, Dr. Chip Chase, who's going to be at our, our next missions conference this, this year, he said, um, he, he asked one of the candidates, how do you know that you're a Christian? You know, and this missionary uh, was, was fumbling around for, for a clear answer. Well, how do I know that I'm a Christian? And then she, this, this young lady pointed out a particular verse. And she said that she demonstrates to others the love that God has shown to her. Well, we that's pretty good. How do you know you're a Christian? And she said, I demonstrate the love that God has demonstrated to me. And so anyone who does not love knows not God because everything, everything about God is love. And without it, ministry is vacant, superficial. Also, uh, Ministry is sincere when compelled by the love of God. When, when, when the love of God compels us, and, and listen to this passage in 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ compels us. Right? How do we get this love? You know, because you're saying, well, you know, I don't know if I have this love for this people here. You know, I'm new, I don't really know them, or I've been here and I really do know them. And they're hard to love. Okay, that's not true. But, you know, maybe you think that, you know. How do I love these people? Or you look outside, how do I love those people? You look at the cross. And, and you look at how God loved us. And, and you look at, for, so, for God so loved the world that he gave. And as we take a look at the cross, it is the love of Christ that compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And so, so here's where this love comes from. It comes from being compelled. And that word compel means to push or to shove. It's, it's kind of like um, uh, when I was in China a couple of Octobers ago, uh, and uh, we, we had a transfer through the Shanghai subway. That was the most crowded place ever in my whole life, was the Shanghai subway system. I mean, uh, literally, I don't think my feet ever had to touch the ground. I mean, it, it kind of did, 
But it, it was so many people, I just got shoved wherever. I don't even know how I got to where we were going. And there was like a team of six of us that were all trying to get to the same place. We all kind of got shoved in that. Oh, I, I've never been in a situation like that. But it's just kind of, you know, without any of your own effort, you just kind of get shoved to where you're going to go. That's the idea of compel. And uh, we will acquire that kind of love when we focus on the love of Christ. Then the love of Christ will compel us to love. It, it com- uh, as hunger compels me to eat, often. Uh, uh, the love of Christ compels us for a loving ministry. And that's why Christ asks, if you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me, you feed my sheep. And then he told that to Peter three times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Well, what if I'm not motivated to? Focus back on the love of Christ. That will compel you. And then third, ministry is supernatural when enabled by the love of God. Ministry is supernatural when enabled by the love of God. Romans 5, 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, you might say, I don't know if I can love these folks. You know, I mean, after all, these people hurt me. You know, I'm feeling awkward. I feel embarrassed, you know, here at church. And, you you know, how can I love them? Well, here, it's not your love. It's the love of God that is being poured into us by the Holy Spirit. It is is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. and, And he has given us this divine love to be able to to love beyond our ability. See, he not only gives us the spiritual gifts, which is a Holy Spirit enablement to do what God can do through us, right? He not only gives us that ability, but then he gives us the love motivation as well to accompany those spiritual gifts. And the Corinthians separated the gifts from the love. They separated the the duty from the Holy Spirit. And, and Paul is saying the Holy Spirit pours this love of God into our hearts. And that's what we need so that our ministry can be accompanied with this particular love. And that's, that's why, you know, I, I love that sacrificial ministry. Uh, one of our seniors remarked after our time yesterday and and, uh, you know, with our, our college careers, uh, cooking lunch and ministering to our seniors, one of our seniors said, wow, you know, they thought of everything. It's nice to be thought of. That's how they felt. It's nice to be thought of. It's, it's the love of God that pours out in our hearts and and, and we do that because we, we love and we think of them. We can even have a little bit of fun, too. And so I bet you've never seen some of our seniors like that. Well, one last thought, too, because I, I know this applies to the church, but this applies to other areas of our life. And as we go through this series on love, we're going to be applying it to other areas of our life. But, but this, this also, in our marriage, no more marriage without love. There's, there's a great book. I think it's still on sale this weekend. It's called Love and Respect by um, uh, Emerson Igerich. And, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of one of the, you know, the popular marriage books going around right now. And, and uh, I, the Kindle one, I think it's $2.99. I'm not sure. But, it's, uh, but it was this weekend. I hope it still is. But he had a quote in this book. He said, 83% of men said they feel disrespected in their marriage. And 72% of the women in marriage feel unloved. You know, and marriage boils down to Ephesians 5.33. Husbands, love your wife, as Christ loved the church, and women, respect your husbands. You know, it, it boils down to those two things. And, and his statistics are 83% of men feel disrespect, 72% of women feel unloved. And so how do we love? How do we love our wives? Love just as Christ loved the church. How did he do that? He gave himself for the church. And are we giving ourselves to our spouse? Are we, or are we 
making them conform to our expectation and expect them to give themselves to us. It was Tony Evans that said, the measuring rod for a biblical lover is the size of the cross he is carrying. The measuring rod for a biblical lover is the size of the cross he is carrying. Right? Are we lovers at home? Are we lovers at church? And, and I, I mean agape lovers that we will love sacrificially because Christ loved us, because it's compelled by the love of Christ, because it is the love of God that is being poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit so that our spiritual gifts are no longer loveless, our ministry is no longer loveless, and now there is going to be change in the church because the church loves each other, because we love God. And we're fulfilling the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And love others as yourself. Um, Kerman, can we, can we uh, close by singing the, the deep, deep love of Jesus? And then if you can look in your hymn books and find out what number it is. Uh, I forgot to look that up. But that was in my head. Deep, deep love of Jesus. And let's all stand as we close. And anybody got a number? Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. I might even have the wrong title. Uh, 352. 352, thank you. 352. Okay. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the deep, deep love of Jesus that compels us to love and ministry. For the deep, deep love of Jesus which is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. For this deep, deep love of Jesus without it, our ministry is a clanging gong. We're nothing. We are unprofitable if we don't have your love. And so, Father, help us to love you, to draw attention to the love of Christ's cross, that from that will be the wellspring of our love for others in ministry. And then, for our love of our family and the people who expect us to love them as Christ loved the church. And so, Father, thank you for this wonderful gift of love that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Next week, verse 4. God bless you.